do you want to be ready to join in with this or do you want to introduce yourself, Francis, to the new people? Francis, are you there? Okay, I'm not sure where Francis is, so I will carry on for now. Um, so um, someone is uh, drawing on the presentation. It might be easier if you don't. Um, so the woman's health in pregnancy uh, is very important. Everything that the woman eats and drinks has the possibility of crossing the placenta and uh, facilitating the health of the placenta. So good growth for the baby and health or negative influences. Um, so your advice, if a woman asks you about uh, what she should do, how she should, uh, uh, what she should eat, what she shouldn't eat, your advice is really important. As you can see, uh, the baby, the, the, all the systems of the baby are supported by the physiology of the woman. So it's essential that the woman is as healthy as possible. That includes her hygiene and also even her dental hygiene, toothbrushing uh, or keeping your teeth clean if, uh, with bamboo or, um, or a toothbrush and toothpaste is very important. An infection in the mouth can cause prematurity. So your advice to uh, the woman is that she should eat as much healthy diet as possible. I'm sure you all know uh, the food advice uh, on, on healthy diet, but there are no foods, uh, no fruit, that she cannot eat. In Chin State, it was traditional that pregnant women did not eat bananas. That is not the case. Bananas are uh, very rich in minerals and all fruit is good fruit. Um, if the fruit does not have a skin, then it is good to wash the fruit if possible. But uh, fruit and vegetables are all essential ingredients. Uh, rice is very good for the diet um, and a little bit of meat. So you're, uh, you're, uh, you have a very good diet for a woman to help in pregnancy. Eggs are very good, very high in protein. Uh, she should cook the eggs, uh, uh, but uh, eggs are good. Clean water, if, uh, if necessary, to boil the water for drinking, but clean water is essential and not too much tea or coffee. Um, a poor diet, I, it would be better if um, people don't uh, draw on the presentation, uh, then everyone can read it. Um, a poor diet can cause uh, anemia, and we will look at anemia in a uh, short but um, it can weaken her blood. Uh, it lowers her iron and um, it uh, if when at the delivery if she uh, loses blood uh, then it will be very dangerous so a good diet is absolutely essential It is really important when you advise a woman that she does not smoke uh, or drink alcohol. These are toxins, as you know, uh, that are uh, very dangerous. Um, they are unhealthy for us as adults, but if they cross the placenta, very small amounts of alcohol will uh, have a big impact on the development of the baby. So it's essential that uh, women do not drink uh, alcohol. Um, 
it can also lead to other problems uh, in her adult life. But for the fetus, alcohol is, uh, there are, we do not know what the safe limits of alcohol are. So we recommend no alcohol. I know most Burmese women do not use alcohol, but um, if you know, uh, it, when you are giving advice, that is the advice. And the same for smoking and also chewing. Um, she should not smoke, she should not chew. Uh, those substances cross the placenta. And because the baby is so small, any substances that cross the placenta are more concentrated and have a bigger impact on the baby. So uh, chewing can cause small babies, can cause uh, uh, short babies, and also uh, can cause premature labor. Um, alcohol in pregnancy can lead to uh, fetal abnormality. You can see here the picture of a baby who has an unusual face uh, and uh, slightly shortened limbs, that baby has uh, been exposed, has fetal alcohol syndrome. So it's essential that you advise the pregnant woman to avoid these substances. As I said, it's very important to keep the body clean. Uh, the skin is a very good back barrier for infection. But if we have a break in the skin, uh, if we have an, in, an injury or a cut that gets infected, that infection can migrate to the placenta and cross the placenta barrier and uh, have an impact on the baby. Uh, a tooth infection, uh, it does not seem logical, but uh, women, because um, the uh, physiology of the woman is uh, inclined to take calcium from the woman's system, it is more easy for a woman to get a dental infection and that infection can migrate across the placenta. So keeping, telling the woman to keep clean, to brush her teeth, to uh, eat good food will maximize the opportunity that a baby is uh, well developed, uh, is uh, born at the right time, at term, at 40 weeks or between 38 and 42 weeks and um, is healthy and strong. Also, it will maximize the uh, chance that the woman's blood is, uh, that she has good iron levels, that she has good platelets uh, and all the components of her blood uh, are um, strong, uh, healthy, which means that her postnatal recovery is going to be more optimum. A woman who has a low HB at delivery, uh, if she bleeds, uh, that uh, will reduce, again, have a, have a greater impact on her well-being. Uh, because she will have much less HB in her system, her capacity to carry oxygen will be reduced. So it's really important that you, in your, uh, when you have opportunities for health improvement, for health uh, advice, uh, that you um, are able to give advice and explain. In the corner of this slide, you can see medicines. Now, it may be that you don't have access to medicines. We recommend that women take no medication at all, except um, iron. So ferrous sulfate or folic acid, uh, which um, you or a CH, a community health worker or a midwife or TBA have given. Sometimes we have seen women who think uh, it is good to take vitamins and they and they try and buy vitamins, but if they are not specific for pregnancy, uh, level diff the wrong levels of uh, vitamin A, uh, vitamin D can, uh, can cause damage. So it's very important that they only take uh, ferrous sulfate um, or folic acid, uh, which you may have available.
Um, are there any questions? Uh, can we use the, the chat? Um, and uh, if there are any questions, um, uh, please do ask some questions. Francis, I don't know if you've got anything to add uh, to, to what I've said. Mike, are we winning? Yes, I'm mute. Okay. Ah, perfect. You so, had the one on mute, that. and I could not hear it. Crash. Sorry ah. about that. I was I overloaded the system with students, so we had a little crash. Oh, okay. I couldn't speak. <laughs> no, no problem. Me. You're now <laughs> you're now free to speak. Okay, we have a question. A really good question. Can a pregnant we woman eat all types of vegetables? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Francis, do you want to add anything? Um, okay, I don't know where Francis is. I will um, find her, don't worry. I will find her. Give me two seconds. Uh, uh, all vegetables are good and all fruit are good. Uh, it's, uh, there is no- Hi, I'm back again. Hello. Is there anything you want to add, Francis? Um, no, I think you covered most of it, Micah, uh, but it was fine. Um, so the I don't know if you saw the question, can a pregnant woman eat all types of vegetables? And oh, yeah. Yes, okay. definitely. Uh, as met, you know, she if she can get good vegetables and good fruit, that's really, really healthy for her. Um, Okay, um, I think it's very straightforward uh, for you. So uh, we will go on now um, to, uh, uh, we will look at uh, taking blood pressure. Now we assume, uh, perhaps you can, uh, yep. uh, I'll share my screen, but we assume yep. that you know, you've all been trained in taking blood pressure. So we're not going to tell you how to take blood pressure, but Francis is going to discuss with you what uh, the significance is of um, blood pressure in a pregnant woman. So um, we know that you have really good knowledge, but we're going to show you how this applies to pregnancy. So if we go onto the screen that says, um, what can make blood pressure high? Is that up, Micah? Hang on, it's about to be. Uh... Sorry. Just going to share my screen now. Uh, there we go. It should be coming up. That's it. So, what can make blood pressure high? There we go. Yeah. Okay. So we know that um, blood pressure can be high in everyone. Um, and there are reasons that this happens. It's often um, people eat too many fatty foods and don't, a poor diet can raise blood pressure and thicken the arteries and um, cause um, illness in a lot of people. So diet's really important 
um, for most people. If you have a, um, overweight and uh, eat all these heavy sugary fatty foods, then your blood pressure is likely to be higher. We also know that drugs can cause blood pressure to high, to become high, and alcohol. Stress is another one. Obesity, pregnancy can make blood pressure go high, and anemia, which thickens the blood. So the cardiac output or heart disease narrows the vessels and increases blood pressure. Okay, Micah, next one. Uh, Micah, next one. Right, that's it. So what does um, high blood pressure do? It makes it harder for the blood to carry food and oxygen from the mother to baby. And this is because the, the, arch, the, the vessels have narrowed. And this means that actually it can cause babies not to grow so well because they're not getting enough nutrition and they're not getting enough oxygen. So it has a major effect on the baby. It can cause preeclampsia um, which is when, um, which is specific to pregnancy. So this blood pressure is rising during pregnancy and becoming very dangerous to mother and baby. It often causes the baby to be born early because the baby is small and not thriving. The baby often is born too early. Another problem is that it can cause bleeding before the birth and also during and after the birth, because the, the mechanisms of shutting down the blood vessels um, is not so strong. Because the blood pressure becomes so high, it can cause a mother to fit and have um, uh, nasty eclamptic fits and be very ill. And the worst um, problems that happen later on in preeclampsia is that the kidneys and the liver begin to fail and then the mother can die. So as you can see, it's a really serious problem. So it's really important that you take the mother's blood pressure very regularly throughout pregnancy. It's important you take a baseline blood pressure at the beginning of pregnancy so you know what is normal for her. Some women will have low blood pressure and some women will have naturally higher blood pressure, but you need to know what her level is. And every time you see her, it's really important to check this blood pressure, particularly um, as the pregnancy progresses. Um, so preeclampsia is high blood pressure in pregnancy. It only happens in pregnancy. And as we say, take blood pressure every time you see a woman before the birth. And if it's above 140 over 90, you need to seek medical aid. There are other signs that she has got preeclampsia. She'll have protein in her urine, high blood pressure and swelling. So when she's got swelling, she can see that she's puffy in her face. Her fingers will swell and she'll get swollen ankles and feet. If she has these symptoms and you are unable to test the urine because we know that there aren't um, a test, uh, a facilities to test urine in the rural areas, but you know her blood pressure is high and you must seek med medical aid. Um, I know it's difficult sometimes to get women to a hospital or to a doctor, but it's better to do it earlier on so that you're not caught out in a, a, a labour situation or after the birth and find that her blood pressure is rising very high and you can't control it. So after the birth, take the blood pressure four hourly um, during the birth and also after the baby's born. It's really important to do it after the baby's born because blood pressure can rise quite dramatically as well. She may not have preeclampsia before the birth, but sometimes after the birth, um, she can develop it then. Um, so really, it's important to take her blood pressure, as I said, every time you see the woman. And if it is high, then recheck it half an hour later to make sure that it's still high. 
Any um, thing to add, Micah, to that? Ah, great, thank you. I wasn't able to unmute. Um, I think uh, if it is high, it is worth uh, asking if the woman needs to urinate. Sometimes a full bladder can make the blood pressure uh, artificially high. So uh, get her to uh, go to the toilet and uh, try it again. And then uh, if it comes down, then you can be, you can feel reassured that it's more normal. Um, I don't think so. Um, headaches, we didn't talk yes. about. Oh, yeah. Headaches, yes. Uh, sometimes women get severe headaches and this is because the blood pressure is rising and causing um, these headaches. So again, headaches, um, swelling in her hands, feet or her face, um, feeling of tiredness also comes over, um, higher blood pressure, protein in the urine if you can check it and um, make sure that you refer this, this woman uh, for medical aid if she has all these symptoms. Um, are there any questions uh, on the blood pressure? There, there's some good Do you questions. see this very often? Do you see this often in Myanmar? There's a great question here on blood pressure. Um, Uh, there's lots of questions. We'll come back to the nutrition questions. We'll just deal with the um, uh, the question on blood pressure. A really good question. The best position to take a blood pressure. Francis, do you the want best, to answer that? Yes. The best, the best position you can see in the um, presentation that she should be sitting. Can you see the, the, the present? Oh, I haven't got the present. So she should be sitting and you should put the cuff on. And here we are, this one here. I'm trying. Yeah. There we go. You can see the best position is for the person should sit down, not lie down, place the cuff around the upper arm, the same height as the heart and listen with a stethoscope. So you can see in this picture that the um, woman is sitting, she is resting her arm on the table and um, the nurse is taking the blood pressure. This is the best position. Um, there was another question about um, uh, exercise. Oh, and what is the effect? Another good question, again, on, B, on blood pressure. What is the effect of changing position um, to, uh, does it increase or decrease the blood pressure? So, so if a mother is lying flat, it will decrease the blood pressure. And if she stands up and does exercise, then it will increase the blood pressure in the same way it does for normal people. Um, and what is the management of high blood pressure? Um, can you do that one, Mike? Because I'm not sure about how, what drugs they have. Um, so um, it will be difficult um, to uh, get drugs in um, um, uh, uh, in very rural areas but with a, a high blood pressure it has to be managed by a doctor. Um, Nifedipine uh, will uh, is normally the first drug of choice uh, in pregnancy uh, and then um, the, um, the doctor will prescribe um, a regime um, according to what her blood pressure does. Um, so uh, with a very high blood pressure, they will give nifedipine to bring it down, and then uh, put the put her on a on a regime where you take her blood pressure every four hours, uh, and if it stabilizes, you uh, manage it um, in pregnancy. 
she will need um, her uh, blood pressure continuing. Uh, you need to continue to take it uh, in uh, after antenatally, um, uh, sorry, postnatally. Um, but again, that is, um, sorry, uh, that is um, doctor led. So um, it's not something nurses can prescribe. Um, if high blood pressure in an adult is not hereditary, would it be good for him? So a, a pregnant woman's, some women can have chronic uh, high blood pressure um, and uh, they, um, they will be carefully monitored throughout the pregnancy, but in pregnancy, the management uh, is the same. Um, it, uh, and she may continue to have chronic hypertension um, after the pregnancy and will need to be managed. Um, but um, not all uh, hypertensive uh, drugs are suitable for pregnancy. So it's really what is available in Myanmar, which is, um, uh, you know, what you have available, which the doctors can prescribe. Uh, the main thing is to monitor the blood pressure. Um, question here uh, about um, uh, exercise. Um, normal exercise, a woman, a fit and healthy woman in pregnancy can do her normal routines. Um, she can, uh, she needs to take care of her back because the abdomen, the enlarging abdomen um, and the softening of the ligaments, which happens in pregnancy to prepare for the birth, can make her back um, more vulnerable to back pain but um, she can exercise normally, she can walk, um, she, can, she can carry uh, within reason, her, do her normal routine. <coughs> she should try to avoid a, a major fall or uh, a major blow impact to the abdomen. <coughs> so um, falling downstairs or whatever can uh, be significant, but in terms of exercise, she can uh, do her normal routine. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, another good question. Uh, is it normal for the breasts to enlarge in pregnancy? Francis, do you want to answer that? And I'll try and get some water. Yeah, it's, <coughs> it's very um, usual for breasts to um, enlarge in pregnancy. Normally, it's one of the signs that you are pregnant. They become very tender. Um, heavier and enlarged. So this is very normal. And towards the end of pregnancy, you can start to lactate a little bit. So yes, it's normal for um, people to have enlarged breast. Um, it says here also, um, if blood pressure, uh, what? oh yes, what blood pressure is concerning during pregnancy? Any blood pressure over 140, over 90 is concerning in pregnancy. So um, if, if that um, blood pressure is continuing to rise, for example, 160 over 100, that's very concerning. So um, you need to monitor it to make sure it's not rising above 140 over 90. I mean, it's possible to, to um, to um, leave a, a woman in the village at that level, but anything above that is, is abnormal. Um, how to do high blood pressure in normal people? How if blood pressure is high and dizziness in adult, what should we do? Um, again, you need to refer it for medical um, help if someone is getting dizziness and feeling faint with blood pressure. But normally the dizziness and faintness means that um, a blood pressure is dropping rather rapidly. Uh, why should not eat papaya? Ah, here's a good question. Why should not we not eat papaya in pregnant women? Again, papaya is very good for pregnant women. We should eat papaya. It's the same as banana, 
uh, eating bananas that we found in Chin State. Eat bananas, eat all fruit. Papaya is good for you. So encourage your women to eat it. Um, can blood pressure predict baby gender? Uh, no, it can't. Uh, blood pressure is specific to the mother and does not have any um, indication on the gender of the baby. What should I do if my blood pressure is 160 over 100? You need to ask um, to see a doctor because that is too high. Um, question um, here, yeah. what medications? So as I've said, we usually um, give uh, w to reduce the blood pressure quite quickly, a fast re release uh, is um, uh, would be nifedipine. Uh, that re reduces the blood pressure quite quickly. Uh, Labetalol is the other drug of choice, which has um, a slightly slower impact. But the uh, this is not something that nurses can prescribe. It has to be carefully balanced so that the blood pressure does not crash and become too low and to sort of maintain a more steady blood pressure. It may not be possible to get the medication that you need to get the drugs that you need. And we do understand that is difficult, but with a very high blood pressure, the woman must, as, as best you can, get medical aid. Uh, if you can do nothing, then um, uh, uh, ask the woman to empty her bladder and uh, ask her to uh, lie on her left side and see if uh, with some rest, the uh, blood pressure, um, if you can bring it down a little bit. What do you do if the blood pressure suddenly drops? On the whole, a low blood pressure in a pregnant woman is not a problem. Um, if it's very low, she might feel dizzy, she might be uh, feeling faint, but um, she, uh, a low blood pressure is not a problem. If she feels uncomfortable, again, she can lie on her left side or rest, uh, and it may be that she has anemia. So you may need to think about her, uh, her diet uh, and folic acid or ferrous sulfate. Um, uh, can a pregnant woman take medicine to reduce her blood pressure in first trimester? Yes, but only with a doctor or a prescribing practitioner. Uh, it's, uh, it is, uh, but it is unusual, unless she has chronic hypertension, it is relatively unusual for preeclampsia to affect the woman uh, in the first trimester. So I think we've covered most of the questions. Really, really good Mike. questions. Sorry, hi, Mike. Can I just jump in on the question about normal uh, blood pressure? So we're talking about non-pregnant women. Was that the was that the question that was asked? And if, if that's the question, then yes, medication absolutely. But there are lifestyle changes that people can make <laughs> in adults, particularly as people get older, to reduce their uh, high blood pressure. Why don't we do this as a question? Can people write in the chat what things we can all do to keep our blood pressure nice and low? I know, can I see the chat? What things can we all do to keep our blood pressure nice and low. Does anyone want to write in the chat? Nobody wants to write in the chat. I'm going to tell you then. So, things that we can do for normal people, for non pregnant women, anybody to keep their blood pressure low, take exercise, 
lose weight, stop smoking, don't drink as much. Those are the big four. If you can manage that and reduce, that will help to reduce your blood pressure over time. Won't happen straight away, but it will happen over time. Okay, so so that's that. Um, Michael, should we carry on? Should we go back to um, go from there? Right. So, um, perhaps. Um, can we finish that one? Yeah. Yeah. Should we go to palpation? Uh, we will. So, um, from Violet, a good question. She just wanted to repeat yeah. the lifestyle choices, and this is true for a pregnant woman as well. Um, I'll write them in the chat. I'll write them in the chat for them. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. That if, um, but just to discuss obesity, if a pregnant woman is very fat, uh, obese at the start of the pregnancy, it is good for her to, she should not think that she can just eat and eat and eat and eat sweet things because she is pregnant. We want her to have a healthy diet. We want her <clears throat> to control her weight. So those, those lifestyle things, which Marcus will put uh, in the chat, um, are true for uh, uh, pregnant women as well. We want them to be healthy. Okay, we're going to talk, we're gonna move on now. This is the third of our four presentations this morning. Um, we are going to discuss uh, palpation. So when the, <clears throat> in later pregnancy, we want to know what position the baby is in uh, relative to the mother. Uh, the best position we know, we discussed it last week, is that the baby is born head down. And um, we're going to uh, go through um, a, a slideshow and then Francis is going to show you on a doll and pelvis what that would actually feel like. So with your hands, you will be able to, and, and do practice it, uh, when you are with a pregnant woman, gently uh, you are able to feel the uh, fetal parts um, to, uh, to uh, work out what position the baby is in. So we'll go through the slide and then Francis will show you. Uh, do you remember last week we used a baby doll and a, uh, and a pelvis and she will show you how that looks. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now um <clears throat> so the um palpation is when we feel from the outside you can see here are some drawings uh the uh the baby has been obviously the baby is inside but uh with your hands you can palpate you can feel the fetal parts and um, the more you practice, the more your hands uh, will give you the information. You will, to begin with, it's, you feel and, it's, and, and you're not sure what you're feeling, but if you uh, practice with uh, a, a pregnant woman, maybe seven months uh, pregnancy, uh, it's quite, it, it gets easier to feel how big the baby is, uh, what position the baby is in, uh, whether the baby is bottom first, if the baby is breech, or if the baby is lying sideways. Uh, some, uh, if there are two babies, uh, it's important to know if we have twins. Uh, and also, uh, we will be doing fetal heart rate next week, but um, it helps you work out where you're going to listen to the baby heartbeat in uh, late pregnancy and in labor. So, um, if you see a woman antenatally several times, so if you are in your communities and you are uh, seeing uh, a woman every couple of months, and we recommend that you do to monitor her health and to monitor the growth, you, um, will know that the baby is growing because if you saw her two months ago you would have been able to feel uh, how so this picture here of the the diagram shows the top of the uterus uh, at different stages of pregnancy the final stage uh, the, the funny circle the last the, the next to last circle is when the baby starts to go into the pelvis 
So um, at the very end of pregnancy, it is normal for the top of the uterus to drop down a little bit. It does not mean that the baby, uh, that there are problems. Um, we will talk about documentation, but if you are in your community and you are seeing women over several months, we recommend that you keep a document for each of the women that you are seeing and you make a record uh, so that you will know last time her fundus was approximately this high and you will know that the baby is growing well. So we, uh, we feel with our hands uh, and what we're trying to feel is how big the baby is, what position the baby is um, and where the head is. The significance of the position is uh, for the birth. So at seven months, uh, we don't have to worry. It's, it's good, it's good practice to know what the position is, but uh, it is not significant. It is only when the woman is about eight months and ready to deliver that the position is significant. So you can see here, uh, this baby is in a breech position. When we palpate, we are feeling uh, the, the most obvious fetal part is the head. And we feel with both our hands, um, maybe Francis, you want, I don't know if, is Francis visible? Or we'll do, we'll do it at the end, Francis. Um, the most obvious part is the fetal head. Uh, it feels hard, it feels round. Now, sometimes the fetal bottom uh, also feels round, but it tends to, and, and hard, but it is not so solidly round. It is possible to make a mistake uh, and we all do it, but uh, what we're trying to find first of all is where the head is. And here <clears throat> you can see number two. If you found the fetal head, you would be able to rock it a baby head uh, rocks, a baby bottom does not rock. So a really good identifier of a breech position is that you find the round hard part and if it rocks in your fingers then you can be pretty confident that you have a head and that the baby is breech. Uh, in, um, in labour uh, and in late pregnancy, we want to know what position the baby is in. We, we, we want the baby to be head down. That's the best position um, because it will uh, lead, promote a stronger contractions, a good labor. Um, so, uh, and it is the most straightforward position for delivering a baby. If the baby is breech, we would recommend that you try to seek medical assistance for the delivery. Um, we will talk about breech birth in um, the, uh, ob the obstetric emergency presentation, which will be next week. But if you are, have identified a breech, it is better to have medical help. Uh, if you cannot find medical help, we will talk about this situation next week. Um, the position that will not deliver is a transverse position or a shoulder position. These babies cannot come through the pelvis unless the position changes. So this, if a woman is laboring and you are confident that she is in a shoulder, the baby is in a shoulder position or a transverse position, you must seek medical aid. Uh, this is impossible. Um, if uh, in late pregnancy, if you identify a transverse position, uh, what you can do to help is to encourage the woman to spend time on her hands and knees in a crawling position because gravity will help, can help to swing the baby round into a better position. So you can encourage her to do this, but if she is in labor, uh, the uterus will uh, contract um, and the, the, the baby will not come down. So it is essential that she has uh, medical aid. So 
here you can see um, when the baby is in a good position, the head will go down into the pelvis and the chin will be tucked in. We'll talk about this a little more in a moment. Um, and you will, from when you palpate, you will be able to feel this. Um, if, the, uh, if you feel that the baby's head is not going down in labor, you can encourage her to be again in a hands and knees position. This will open the pelvis and the contractions will help to push the baby down. Um, and uh, in an anterior position, we want the baby to be anterior. So we want the baby to be LOA if possible. Uh, so that the back of the baby is on the outside rather than the back to, to the mother's back. It is the best position. And being on your hands and knees uh, is can be helpful to bring the baby to LOA. Um, Francis, do you just want to show what it would be like on the outside? Okay, so here we have a baby um, and when I palpate, I would be feeling with my hands to see which way I can feel the back. So um, I can feel the spine because you can feel your spine here. You can feel the spine on the baby running up here. So she is lying on my left. I also go to feel the baby's head. Now, when I feel the baby's head, I can put my hands down into the, the, uh, the pelvis and um, feel how much head I can feel. And if the, the head is right in the pelvis like that, I cannot feel the head, it's right in. But in the early part of labor, the head will be up here and I can feel it. And the more it goes into the pel pelvis, the less I can feel. So here is the pelvis. You can see when it's up here in early labor or pre-pregnant in, in, in antenatally, it'll be up here. And as the pregnancy progresses from about 36 six weeks onwards, the head will go into the pelvis. And during labor and the birth, the head will go more and more down into the pelvis. And you can feel this with your hands. Once the head is deeply in the pelvis, you can't move it. Up here, you can move it. So it's really useful measurement because you know once the head is into the pelvis, the baby will birth well. You can also feel the position, as Mike has said. The baby's head is best tucked in like that. If it's not tucked in, you can see the diameter of the baby's head is much wider to come through. So we encourage the mother to go on all fours because if I'm doing that position, the pelvis will open. You will see, here's the pelvis. If she's lying on her back like that, it will be narrower. Once she comes upright and on all fours, you can see this diameter increases here. If she's not like that, you can see how narrow it is and then it will open if she is on all fours. So it's a good position. If a baby is breech, you can palpate because you will feel the back here and you won't feel a head moving here. You will feel a head up here and you can feel it moving about when you palpate. If the baby is lying sideways across, again, the thing to feel, you'll feel lots of legs and feet, and also you may feel a, a head here. So feeling the mother's abdomen is crucial to knowing where the baby is lying. And this is so important for birth. It also helps us to know where to listen to the baby's heartbeat. So if the baby is tucked into my pelvis here, I know the back is here, the head is down here, I can listen to the baby's heartbeat here. If I can hear the baby's heartbeat here and feel the head here, I know it is coming head first. If it's a breech birth, 
I won't hear the heartbeat here because the heart is higher up. I will feel a head up here, no heartbeat here, the heartbeat will be up here. So any other questions? Anything to add, Micah? I was I couldn't unmute um just we've had a really good question um yeah. can a breach presentation do a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery yes a breach presentation can do a normal uh, vaginal delivery and sometimes breaches deliver very quickly so it's very good to be aware which way the baby's coming because if it is coming bottom first you need to know that the bottom is in a good position. But we will go through breach later, the breach birth position later. But it's very possible for um, a baby to be born breech if it's in a good position. If its leg is coming out first, it is more difficult. Or because the most breaches deliver in the best position with the legs up like that. But if a leg is coming out, then that is more difficult. Or if the uh, knees are bent and two feet coming down, that again is more difficult. So if the breech is in a good position, yes, it's possible to deliver well. But we will do a breech birth later. Um. Just the, to go back to the blood pressure, we missed a question about antihypertensive. Um, and um, uh, there was a good question saying that nifedipine is difficult to get in Myanmar, asking if amiodipine uh, is available for pregnant women. And in this country, we do not use it. So I'm afraid I do not have the answer, but we can look it up. Um, I will uh, look up <clears throat> in time for next week what the alternatives might be to uh, nifedipine. Okay, uh, another great question. Um, can you, uh, two questions. Um, uh, how can I feel uh, the breech presentation when I take a vaginal examination? So again, you uh if with a vaginal examination when you are feeling uh, the baby's head you will feel smooth and round with a breech presentation you um the uh the 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 presenting part the bottom you tend to feel it's a bit softer um of, often the baby will uh, open their bowels will pass meconium in a breech delivery not always but if you have meconium that is uh that has come out like toothpaste so we do have meconium in the water sometimes in the amniotic fluid but if it's come out as uh as a particulate mm. meconium like poo uh that is an indication that there's a bottom in the vagina uh, but a a, a a a bottom feels differently from a head it is it is possible to make a mistake. We we all make mistakes, uh, but it usually if you uh, are thinking, uh, the head will feel harder and rounder. Another good question, and then we will move on to breach. Uh, sorry, move on to normal birth. Can the fetus turn to the normal position? So in pregnancy. Um, the uh, in in at seven months or 36 weeks um, possible uh, if you um, the, by woman's lifestyle her position if she spends a lot of time uh, on her uh, knee hands and knees if you think there's a breach that those sorts of things will encourage the baby to turn um, in our country we we also try to turn uh, a doctor or a skilled midwife. Uh, we send women to the hospital to try and turn the fetus abdominally 
to get them out of the breach position. But it's very unlikely that you um, have that facility in uh, very communal areas. It is something that a skilled practitioner can do, um, but it must be a skilled practitioner because um, the umbilical cord can tangle uh, when the fetus is turned or being turned. And that's why we, uh, it's important that it's done in a hospital. In a rural area, um, I think Francis would agree that it's safer to let the baby be born breech than to try and turn the, uh, the fetus abdominally uh, without medical assistance. Is that, would you agree? Yes. Uh, we, we know that some traditional birth attendants in remote areas are very skilled at turning some of the babies. So um, if they're a very skilled person and they can feel and palpate babies position well, and um, then um, yes, yeah, sometimes they can do this. But uh, if you're not skilled, it is not a thing you should be doing. So again, uh, the next question, uh, it, it is in, uh, in a hospital environment, it is more preferable to deliver the fetus uh, a, a, a cephalic, so head down. Um, and it, it, one of the options for the woman would be to manually correct the position of the baby. But in a rural area, because of the danger of cord accident uh, and also the danger potentially of putting the baby into a more difficult position like a shoulder presentation, uh, it is important uh, that it is not done without somebody who is a skilled practitioner. Um, Marcus, are you happy that we do birth the birth presentation? I think we should, yeah. We've got so many people on here and so many great questions. Um, just uh, uh, all I'm, I'm having to kind of um, unmute you manually. So if I don't manage to, just wave at me or something like that. Okay, sorry about that. It's just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> something like that whatever works but um yeah i mean wow this is a i mean it, it just keep going <laughs> so another great question uh hands and knees position is always good francis if you uh, can you show the pelvis again uh, and what happens to the sacrum and the coccyx when you lean forward hands and knees um. In late pregnancy, she can do it as many times a day as she wants. Uh, she, it is better that she does not sit back on a chair. Uh, so if she's sitting, uh, it's better just to be in an open position or a kneeling position. But Francis will show you with the pelvis what the change to the sacrum and the coccyx is. Okay, so if a mother is lying flat, you will see that the coccyx is, is um, being pushed up into the top of the pelvis. So mother is lying flat. There is not so much room here. But if we turn the pelvis over, you will see that the coccyx is then free to move away. And you will see that with doing that, it will open and there'll be a much wider position. So if the coccyx is pushed down, it's very evident that there is less room. If she is on all fours, you can see how it opens. Again, if you're in labor, if you're having a poo, if you're going to the toilet, do you lie flat on your back to go to the toilet? No, none of us all lie flat on the top. We squat to go to the toilet. And this makes the pelvis open, makes it easier to push the baby out. So it's always better if possible to be upright, particularly for a breech birth. It also in late pregnancy will encourage yeah. the baby to, uh, to swing. Francis, if you show the, um, the baby, the back of the baby hanging down, so if she's lying down or spending a lot of time in a chair, in a reclining chair, in a, on a sofa or uh, one of those low plastic chairs, 
it's the the weight of the spine is encouraging the it will be more likely to go into her back if she spends time which is not such a good position or similarly the breech position but if she spends time in a forward position with her legs open or on her hands and knees gravity will encourage the spine of the baby which is the heavier part to swing round so uh that is why being in a hands and knees position is really helpful um and you can uh she can spend as much time uh in that position uh during the day as pos uh, you know as is comfortable so question here thank you francis shall i show you just the knee position can you see me uh yes a very good view of Frances. <laughs> if she's kneeling on the floor and resting on a chair, it's important she does not have her knees together. No, she should have her knees apart and her feet open. So then she makes the pelvis open wide, open up, and the baby can come through more easily. So she must not have her knees together like that. She should have them open and give birth like that. Okay. So the question uh, from Thyset Cho, thank you. You said breach transverse shoulder position. Uh, what is good for normal delivery and what must be delivered by cesarean? Breach and uh, cephalic can both be delivered normally. Transverse and shoulder will not deliver it vaginally. That must be a cesarean. If the position cannot be changed by a skilled practitioner, the, uh, the, the shoulder will never go down into the pelvis and a transverse lie, it will never go down into the pelvis. So, um, it's uh, those are the only two if you are in the community that you must try to get to hospital but a, a, a breach position we're not going to cover that today we will go through it very uh, clearly next lesson uh, a breech position can deliver normally and will not cause fracture to the baby uh, so, uh, we will show you how there are some quite strict rules um, uh, but they can deliver without fracturing the baby. Um, uh, so um, that's all we're going to say about breach. I think we'll move on now. These are brilliant, brilliant questions. Keep them coming and we will come back to them. But we'll move on now and show you the birth process. We looked at a film last week. Now we're going to go into more detail on the birth process. So I'm going to share my screen and Francis and I will uh, talk to you about this um, together. Uh, sorry. Hopefully you can see my screen now. That's working beautifully, yeah. Um, Francis, do you want to start? Yes. So in the first picture, you can see that the cervix is tight shut and this is um, before um, labour starts so it's very important that that cervix stays tight shut because that is keeping the baby safe inside and keeping it safe inside the bag of waters. Um, as she goes into labour the contractions or the, 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 the uh, pains and tightenings will shorten the cervix and lift it up and this then will begin to open. Uh, this is when the cervix is completely flat and um, that means that it's completely effaced and now she is in established labour. So before this time the woman is what we call in the latent phase of labour. This can take um, 24 hours for a first baby where she will have some um, tightenings and contractions 
Um, they may last for a few hours or, and they may go away again and she can rest and then they can come back um, and then they come back stronger. And eventually once she has got to four to five centimeters, the cervix is completely flattened and beginning to open. Then she is starting her proper labor. Eventually this cervix is completely open. And once the cervix is completely open, then she is in the second stage of labor. So this bit is the first stage. Once the cervix is open, she is in the second stage. And then the baby's head can come through. Before that time, there's no way the baby can come out. Once she is in the second stage, she will find that the baby's head is coming down into the pelvis and she will get a lot of pressure onto her bottom, her back passage. And she may um, feel that she needs to go to the toilet and she will start to push out, push the baby out. So here we can see different view of the, pel of the baby's head coming down and coming out. The third stage of labor is when the placenta is delivered. Okay, Michael, the next one. So again, you can see how the cervix is opening. Here it is shut, beginning to thin. Here it is fully open. The baby's head is coming down and then the shoulders come through sideways. As we showed you last time with the dolum pelvis. Um, the, the posterior shoulder comes first and then the anterior shoulder and then the baby is delivered. The third stage of labor is when the placenta comes out. It's really important once the baby is delivered that you place the baby skin to skin um, so that um, the baby is close to mother um, and um, is kept warm and clean. Francis, can we just talk about the membrane? Yeah. Okay. They're back. Um, yeah, the baby is in a sack of water here, which is completely seals the baby within um, the, the membrane. So the baby is completely sealed and this prevents infection coming up through here. It prevents all that infection. And this is really important that the baby is clean and kept safe within that bag of water. In early labor, as the cervix opens, often there is a mucus plug that comes away. Sometimes there's a bit of blood in that mucus plug, but other times it's just clear and jelly-like. So the mucus plug will come away often in early labor, but sometimes this doesn't happen till she is in full established labor. Sometimes the waters, the, the bag of membranes that the baby is in, you can see it here, stays intact right until the end of the labor. So when she starts pushing, this can break. Other times, these bags of water can break early, um, early in labor. Um, the risk of a bag of water breaking early in labor or before she is established in labor means that there is a risk that infection can creep up around the baby. So it's important to know when these bags of waters break um, because then you can know how long the baby has been exposed to infection. Again, we talked about different positions for labor. It was always traditional that a baby, a mother would lie flat. In the UK for many years, women lie, lay flat on the bed. But now we're encouraging the mother to be upright. The best position is for our upright supported so that the baby's head can come down more easily as we showed you. You can see this picture here where the mother is holding on um, to a strap that is tight and she can then bear down and push down. All fours position is good and this one, um, and you can see that it's easy to deliver a baby like that. Okay. 
Again, when the mother starts to push the baby's head out, it's really important that we take this very slowly. So the best way to do this is once you see a, a fair bit of head, you can see the head coming. As the cervix opens, the, the head is coming down and you can see a little bit of head and she's pushing oh, and she's pushing oh, and she's pushing oh, and so it opens nicely. You can see here the picture that it's opening and opening, but it's really important to take this slowly. If she pushes hard like that, she can tear. Okay, so oh, 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 and as the head comes down as wide as that, then you want to stop her pushing and get a pant. So you go, don't push. And then it will slide through and be born. So the head then has come through nicely. And then you can see the whole body. And again, now we wait with the head born and we just wait for the shoulders to turn. We need the shoulders to turn because it's difficult for them to be born front ways. So as the head came down like that, then it'll turn. The shoulders will get in a good position. And again, she will feel like to push. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And then the shoulders will come through and you will lift the baby to the mother, skin to skin. So we have talked about the birth. This is a picture here of putting pressure on the baby's... If, right. So if the baby is taking a long time to come down, that you must not never push, try to push the baby out. Never push the baby out. This is because the uterus can rupture, it can break. Because you put too much pressure and the head can't come out, push, push, oh, 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 it'll break. So do not put pressure on the uterus. The other thing is you must not try and pull the baby out. So if the head is through the pelvis, the head has come through, do not try and pull the baby out. If you try to pull the baby out, the shoulders will get stuck. You cannot get them out. So do not pull the baby's head out. It can also cause a shoulder injury, a brachial plexus injury, which will cause a uh, paralysis, uh, a weakness in the arm. So uh, it does not facilitate the birth of the baby and you can cause an injury to the baby's shoulder and to the nerves running through uh, into the baby's face and down the arms. Uh, we will tell you how to rotate a baby if shoulders are stuck um, next week. Okay. <clears throat> so it's important to put the baby skin to skin straight away. Okay. And if possible, breastfeed the baby. Um, once The breastfeeding of the baby will cause uh, further contractions to the uterus. The oxytocin uh, that the, uh, is integral to breastfeeding will uh, strengthen the contractions of the uterus. So breastfeeding uh, immediately uh, helps the uh, third stage of the delivery, helps to reduce uh, the risk of hemorrhage. 
Um, so it's really important. It's good for the baby, skin to skin and breastfeeding, but it can uh, really, it does facilitate the third stage. Okay, so we don't um, encourage you to try to deliver the uh, placenta as soon as the baby is born. You must wait until there are signs of separation. We don't use, um, you are on the whole in countryside, there are no oxytocin drugs to help the placenta deliver more quickly. So we must do it in the natural form and to try and pull the placenta out, um, to try and pull the placenta out, you can cause a lot of damage. So we are waiting to see when this placenta has separated. So you will have certain signs. There'll be a fresh blood of percent of uh, um, a slight show of fresh blood when the placenta starts to separate from the side of the uterus. There will be some bleeding. Okay, you can see in the picture there. The cord it will get longer as the placenta falls down into the bottom of the uterus. This cord will lengthen so you will see the cord get longer inside. The mother's tummy will rise up so you will be able to feel the mother's tummy and it will rise up. You will feel the placenta here rising up and the mother will also feel like pushing so she will feel as if she needs to go to the toilet. So the best way for the placenta to come is help the baby to breastfeed, to stand up and to pass urine. It's really important if it's taking a long time for the placenta to separate that you get her upright and go to the toilet because by passing urine, she will empty her bladder and there'll be more room for the placenta to come through. Once the placenta has fallen into the bottom of the uterus, you can get her to stand up and push it out. <clears throat> and it will come down and then you deliver the placenta. At this stage, you can tie the placenta and cut it. As we said last week, you can cut it with a pair of scissors that have been boiled for at least 10 minutes a clean razor blade or a bit of bamboo that is clean, not been on the floor. Um, it needs to be washed before you use it. Um, and after that, it's important to check the placenta that it's all present and that the membranes are there and uh, nothing has been left behind. After the placenta is delivered it's important to feel the mother's tummy feel the mother's tummy and rub it and there will be some bleeding there will be some bleeding it's normal for bleeding okay do not says do not pull the placenta out before it separate the mother will bleed you can see in this picture that the placenta is being pulled out, there'll be a lot of blood, and then the mother will hemorrhage and be very ill um, and shocked. So do not pull it out. Um, if the mother is bleeding heavily, it's important to put fundal pressure on the top of the uterus. So you pr press hard and you get your fist and press the uterus together and this will help stop the bleeding. Occasionally if you can't get the placenta out we will have to take it out manually um, with your hand. But this is very very dangerous in a rural area. The mother will experience severe pain and there is a high risk of infection. So it's better if you can get the mother upright pushing the placenta out um, than trying to take it out manually. Just to add, yes. the reason for not pulling the placenta is that we want the uterus 
to contract. When the uterus contracts, the placenta peels away from the wall of the uterus. But those contractions, all the muscle fibers uh, that crisscross the uterus are responsible for ligating all the blood vessels on the mother's side. So the contractions close off all the blood vessels. If you pull the pl placenta when there is no contraction, the blood vessels remain open because the, the muscle fibers have not closed, sealed, ligated the blood vessels. And that's why it's so essential. If the placenta is slow, the essential thing is to create contraction. That is what will deliver the placenta. We create contraction by breastfeeding, by rubbing the uterus, um, by uh, changing position, being upright. That will encourage contraction. And it is the contraction that will deliver the placenta safely. Pulling will only cause danger to the mother. Um, so after the birth, uh, we, uh, Francis, do you want to? No, that's fine. After the birth, we uh, check the perineal uh, area for tears. We check for bleeding. Um, the most, and we will look at hemorrhage in the next session, but the majority of uh, bleeding difficulties are caused by the uterus. But occasionally the uh, vaginal tear is quite advanced, is quite deep, and uh, we can have excessive bleeding from that. So we want to check for tears. We want to check uh, that the anal sphincter in particular has not been damaged. If there is, if the tear extends to the anal sphincter, she must receive medical aid. This is this will lead to serious uh, bowel dysfunction and uh, is leads to infection. It is very unusual if you deliver the head slowly. It is common for a small tear, a vaginal tear. Uh, even if it involves a little muscle, that is quite normal. But uh, with a normal cephalic uh, vertex birth, the, uh, it's very unlikely that the anal sphincter will be damaged. Um, but um, if it is, you must seek medical attention. Some of you will uh, know how to suture and you might even have suture material uh, available. If, and we will look at the perineal uh, perineum again in a future session but most tears if it's just vaginal wall and a little bit of uh, muscle you can put a pad against the vagina on the perineum and compress the area a clean pad and compress it and encourage the mother now we want to encourage the mother to bring her knees together because this will bring a small tear together and the compression will stop any bleeding. Um, we will talk about uh, suturing another time if that is something that is available to you and you want to discuss. So finally, uh, we'll just run through a quick summary um, for care during the birth. Wash hands, we talked about that. We talked about preparing equipment last time. We want the mother to be relaxed. We want her to eat and drink and uh, feel comfortable. We want her to move around. We've talked about positions. Uh, when, we, when we arrive, we want to palpate the mother. We want to check the baby's position and we want to listen to the baby heartbeat, which we will discuss again next lesson or, or in two lessons. We will take the mother's pulse and her temperature and her blood pressure every four hours, just to make sure that we're happy with her condition. And throughout the labor, we will look out for uh, any bleeding. Uh, sometimes there is some blood loss, some mucousy blood loss, which comes from the plug of the cervix or as the cervix is opening. A little bit of blood loss on uh, is normal. Uh, so even uh, you know, in the birth, a, a tablespoon of blood loss 
is normal. That is not a hemorrhage. Blood loss in pregnancy is, uh, we need to, uh, you know, we would always seek medical help, but small amounts of bleeding and labor are normal. We want her to keep her bladder empty. We want her to go to the toilet because the, an empty bladder will make more space in the pelvis for the head to come down. And if her bag of waters has ruptured, if the membranes have ruptured, we will keep an eye on the colour of the water. If the baby has opened the bowels and there is meconium, the water will be a, a, a brownish, greenish colour. And um, again, in uh, so sometimes that can be a sign that the baby is not happy and uh, we would want the mother to stay upright, to stay mobile, because we want the baby to, her labour to, to advance uh, fairly strongly. Um, but uh, it, it, if the water is clear or a yellowish colour, then that means the baby has not opened their bowels and that is the best, uh, least likely to cause difficulty. Um, we've, we want to monitor how, how regularly the, the contractions are coming. If they are irregular, so maybe you have three in 10 minutes and then you have nothing for 10 minutes and then you have one and then you have one half an hour later. This means she is not in labor. She is in the latent phase, as Francis said. What we want is for the contractions to be coming three or four contractions every 10 minutes and for them to, for the mother to be, she has to concentrate, she feels them strongly. When that is happening, we want to attend the woman. We want to stay with her. We will not leave her alone. But earlier on, she can stay mobile, she can eat, she can drink. You don't have to be there continuously. And finally, uh, we, as we've said, we want her to be comfortable. We give her massage. We allow her to rest. We, uh, we tell her she's doing brilliantly. Uh, she needs encouragement. Sometimes she's very tired. So we use our hearts uh, and our voices to encourage her. And we will listen to the baby heartbeat in labour if we can with a pinard. Uh, and uh, when the baby is in second stage, we want the delivery of the head to be slow so that the perineal tissue has time to stretch. Um, and uh, the mother, sometimes she's pushing really strongly, but we tell her to slow down, to breathe, because you can't push and at the same time. Uh, so we want to reduce the risk of tearing as much as we can. And as we said, we do not cut the cord until the placenta has delivered. Um, that is the best moment. Once the placenta is out, the cord is no longer useful and skin to skin and breastfeeding and urinating will always be helpful for the for the delivery of the placenta and documentation we write things down we write our timings uh, we write our observations uh, because you will you will forget you're so busy thinking about many different things documentation will show us what the story is, what the patterns are, uh, and if necessary, if you need to ask for medical assistance, you will be able to report what your observations were. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, if we have uh, any questions or if we need to go, I'm conscious that we've had an hour and a half of data. Give as much time as you like today because we're going to do COVID tomorrow. So um, can I ask people to maybe, um, Sister Momo, I'm going to unmute you and then you can ask uh, people if they'd like to um, put their questions in the chat. Um, and if not, then we will see everyone tomorrow at 1.30 for uh, COVID teaching for nurses. There's a good question, really good question. Right. Do you use controlled cord traction? And uh, not we when you use oxytocin or oxytocin drugs like Sintometrin, 
uh, in a in a hospital situation or in a medicalized situation, we would uh, give an injection into the thigh of an oxytocin drug, and in that situation, uh, we would uh, place our hand uh, on the just above the pelvis. Uh, sorry, just above the pubic uh, arch, and we would use, uh, we, we hold a hand against the abdomen to make sure that the uterus does not invert, and we would use controlled cord contraction. But you, we must never ever do that in a countryside situation where oxytocin drugs have not been used. The oxytocin drug causes the contraction that I was talking about and causes all the uterine blood vessels that were uh, supporting the placenta, causes those blood vessels to ligate, to close. That's what the oxytocin drug does. When, when that contraction has done its job, then we can use controlled cord contraction. But in a physiological third stage, it is essential to wait for the mother to push the placenta uh, because the, the physiological contraction must be caused by the uterus contracting itself. So we do not use cord traction. Uh, good, another good question, should you wear a tummy tuck? Uh, so I think you're talking about, should you bandage the uh, abdomen or use some sort of um, elastic girdle after giving birth and uh, no it is not necessary women are in fact it is better for the woman to use her abdominal muscles but we would say uh, don't uh, you know go slowly to the mother be careful be careful of your back be careful of your abdominal muscles so don't do any heavy lifting don't do big exercise or lots of sit-ups uh, but we want the muscles of the abdomen to gently uh, tone up and it's better uh, in a way not to use a tummy tuck because um, the normal tone will restore in the woman by uh, her normal movement, by picking up the baby, by moving around, by doing some cooking and so on. And we'll also encourage um, the mothers to do their pelvic floor exercises to strengthen their pelvic floor after the birth. So it's important um, that um, we teach them pelvic floor exercises. If you need how to know how to do these, we can teach you at a, a later date. Okay, are there any more um, questions from anyone? I think that's about it. That's about it. Oh, there's one more. There's a, there's a new message at the bottom. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. We really enjoyed it. We, we think it's wonderful that you're here. Uh, for us, it is a great privilege, really and truly, from our hearts to be, uh, to be with you, uh, to be helping uh, in a very difficult time for Myanmar uh, and we really uh, appreciate your commitment to uh, helping mothers in pregnancy and birth and supporting maternal child health. Uh, it's amazing what you're doing. We'd like to say also what brave women you are. We have great admiration for you. And men, I think there were some male men. Yeah, there were some men around too. Yeah. Um, just, just quickly, um, tomorrow, 